during a political steering group meeting held on January 22, 2008, between the State Secretary of Kingdom Relations, Mrs. Ank Bailefelds Houghton, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands Antilles, Mrs. Emily de Jong El Hage, Commissioner of Curacao, Mrs. Seta Jesus Leito, and Commissioner of St. Martin, Mrs. Sarah Westcott Williams, an agreement as a conditio sine qua non was signed for further progress on the constitutional reform, which was later identified as the ambitious 101010 10 agenda. The signatories at that time had to give insight into existing regulations with regard to corporate governance issues. There was no such regulation, neither in Aruba, um, Curacao, nor in St. Martin. And the persons who signed that document that I referred to um, earlier committed themselves and the countries to establish new regulations in the area of corporate governance on one procedures to dispose of and to acquire holdings, guidelines for a policy on dividends, procedures and requirements for the appointment and dismissal of supervisory board members of government-owned companies. But what is corporate governance? Corporate governance is a set of procedures, customs, policies, laws, and institutions affecting the way corporate corporations uh, managed, administered, or controlled. It includes the relationship of stakeholders involved and goals for which the corporation is governed. Good governance conforms to certain principles. With other words, clear areas of responsibilities are attributed to the various bodies of the corporation, which are executed with integrity, transparency, and with accountability without potential conflict of interest. The main objective being the furtherance of the continuity of the corporation, the interest of all stakeholders. Good corporate governance is not really difficult to realize. It is a matter of integrity, again, the word integrity, discipline, and transparency. Most of all, it is a matter of understanding how things work who has which responsibilities, where the box stops, and respecting that. Internationally, we have the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, who adopted guidelines in the year 2005 for this kind of operation. These guidelines call on government to ensure level playing field for state own enterprises, so government companies, competing with the private sector, become more informed and more active shareholders, empower the directors and supervisory boards by clarifying their mandate and respecting their independence while systematically monitoring their performance and improve transparency. Who are the stakeholders, you may ask? The term stakeholders can be interpreted very widely in, the context, in this context to include the stakeholder himself, the employees, the clients, and the community at large. That was my brief introduction on the basic information. We now turn to the rules and procedures as it pertains to the appointment of board members to government-owned companies. Taking the signed agreement as referred to above into consideration, the legislative framework for the corporate governance operation on St. Martin was established as follows. The Island Council of St. Martin established its rules on May 11, 2009. The Island Council of Curacao established theirs on October 12, 2009. And the Netherlands Antilles established theirs on December 29, 2009. The decree of the Island Council of St. Martin, dated May 11, 2009, was to establish the Corporate Governance Council. And the decree of the Island Council of St. Martin, also dated May 11, 2009, and amended on December 16, 2009, was to establish the Corporate Governance Code. 
if you notice, you will know that all these things were established in 2009. Why in 2009? Because during the political steering group meeting held on the 22nd of January, all these things had to be in place between the 6th and the 8th of February the following month. And you can realize that they were not in place, so there was a lot of catching up to do. Anyhow, we'll continue. But what is corporate governance? What is the corporate governance code? The corporate gov the code is an instrument that serves as a guarantee for the quality and impartiality of public servants and offers proper checks and balances within government-owned corporations and government-controlled foundations. The ordinance corporate governance goes out from the following premises or consideration, and listen very carefully, that it is desirable that the island territory St. Martin establish rules with regard to the decision-making process in matters regarding the involvement of the public entity St. Martin in corporation and foundation and disposes of proceedings in the area of transfer and acquisition of shares in companies in which it is involved and establishes procedures and requirements for the appointment and the dismissal of board members of the corporations and foundations in which it is involved. And the final one, proceedings where proper governance of corporations and foundations are promoted. On the government-owned corporation must be understood the following. A limited liability company with a legal seat on one of the island territories of the Netherlands Antilles and whose shares, part or in full, are in the hands of the island territory through direct intervention of a third party. And under a government-controlled foundation must be understood a foundation where the government has the authority to decide on appointment and dismissal of one or more directors or to amend the articles of incorporation. The corporate governance code is comprised of the following important chapters. And here is where you get where things really get interesting. General principles, corporate structure of the corporation, supervisory board, the managing board, general shareholders meeting, and reporting regarding corporate governance. The rules as established in the National Ordinance Corporate Governance, the Corporate Governance Code, and all resulting regulations and applicable, are applicable to the companies. The companies are obliged to comply with aforementioned rules and regulation. In the meantime, the National Ordinance Transitional Legal and Administrative Provisions has gone into effect. So where mention is made of Island Ordinance or Executive Council must now be read National Ordinance and Minister. The text of the Island Ordinance Corporate Governance has been consolidated in a National Ordinance and it has been published in publication sheet number, um, publication sheet 2013, GT number 19. The National Ordinance Corporate Governance contains the following articles, namely, Article 1, Definition, 2, Decision Making, 3, Corporate Governance Code, 4, Corporate Governance Council, Five, dividend policy. Six, acquisition of shares. Seven, transfer and objection to shares. Eight, proceedings and profile framework. Nine, appointment of directors. 10, dismissal of directors. 11, representation. And 12, the final and my favorite article, budget corporate governance. Article 8 of the ordinance, that is the important document that we all want to hear about. Article 8 of the ordinance states in part, if by or on behalf of the minister, 
a decision or co-decision is made regarding the profile assessment of the company or foundation for an appointment or nomination to an appointment of directors, the minister reports the decision to that appointment in writing with justification to the corporate governance council. Again, in writing with justification. Article 9 states, if by or on behalf of the minister, a decision or co-decision is made regarding the appointment or nomination of a director, the minister reports the decision to appoint or nominate to that appointment or nomination in writing with justification to the con corporate governance council. And Article 10 states in part, if by or on behalf of the minister, a decision or co-decision is made regarding the dismissal of the director, the minister reports the decision for dismissal in writing and with justification to the corporate governance council. Within four weeks after that, after receipt of the reports mentioned above, the corporate governance council sends its advice in writing to the minister regarding the issue decided upon of its compliance to the corporate governance code. The profile referred to in Article 8 is approved by the shareholder. The shareholder rep is responsible for that document being made available. It contains the following information. One, information on the composition of the board of the supervisory directors amount of supervisory directors, the composition of the board of supervisory directors, the functioning of the board of directors, and the remuneration of the supervisory directors of the board. It also entails the profile of supervisory directors and the explanation of the profile of the supervisory directors and profile of the chairman of the board and an explanation of the profile of the chairman of the board. So as you can see, everything is regulated. And that also brings me to the end of my brief presentation. And in closing, I wish to end my little contribution this evening by emphasizing that government actions must be fundamentally grounded in the law. And I thank you. Um, a very important subject tonight, it's uh, about personal liability and uh, risks for directors and members of the supervisory board. Um, the financial crisis, which I hope is um, for the largest part now behind us, and the um, increasing influence of active shareholders and corporate governance rules have resulted in a renewed interest in possibilities and risks of personal liability. Uh, for directors and members of the supervisory board. And, and, al and this, although you probably won't imagine, but it is not always deemed a post of honor to be in the position of a director of a company or another legal entity, like, for instance, a foundation. Directors usually possess a significant amount of power and influence in a company, and because of that also a substantial amount of, of uh, responsibilities and obligations. Directors and members of the supervisory board do often not realize this well enough, and it is therefore that I consider it a good idea to speak to you about this important subject this night, tonight. Um, I will also speak about the legal position of directors and, mem and members of the board of the supervisory board in relation to what is called corporate governance, where it pertains to government-owned companies. In the corporate governance discussion, the question is what good governance exists, uh, consists of, in what way adequate supervision can be maintained, and how responsibility is divided between the various administrative bodies of the company. <clears throat> and the first question, question that arises is, of course, what does director's liability exactly mean? Well, director's liability is, of course, the liability of directors for their acts committed or omitted on behalf of a company. And there are 
different grounds, various grounds for such a liability. However, before I come to address these different grounds um, for liability and the related case law, I will first discuss the role of a director in a company, after which the role of the supervisory director and the general, general assembly of shareholders will be explained in short. Both the regulations of Book 2 of our Civil Code, the Civil Code of St. Martin, and the Articles of Incorporation of a Company define the rights and obligations of, respect of the director, the supervisory board of directors, and the shareholders, respect respectively. We come um, at first uh, to the post of director, and the director, as you, are, as you all will know, is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the company, and he, she, or it, represents the company in and outside of legal issues. Please be aware of the fact that the company itself can also function as a director, and the director is responsible for effectuating and or executing the corporate objectives, the strategy, the goal, and the policy of the company and its related business or enterprise. <coughs> then we come to the post of a supervisory director. <clears throat> it is the task of the supervisory board of directors to supervise the manner in which the director or management carries out the company's policies and to supervise the general management as executed by the director. For a proper fulfillment of his or her statutory task, it is important that supervisory directors can act both independently and impartially. Independency and impartially, impartiality sorry, has in turn two dimensions. In the first place, the independent and impartial um, within the board of supervisory directors, and in the second place, uh, independent and impartial in relation to other players with, within the corporate regime of a company like shareholders and the director. The board of supervisory directors should act in a transparent manner, and by doing so, the board of supervisory directors can account for the proper fulfillment of its obligations. Members of the supervisory board are often, cho are often um, chosen based on their knowledge, expertise, and experience. And last but not least, I come to the General Assembly of Shareholders. And why not least? Because, as you know, shareholders are actually the owners of the company through their shares. Um, it is the authority of the General Assembly of Shareholders to appoint and to dismiss directors and members of the Supervisory Board of Directors and also maintain, maintain some other core tasks, like the authority to approve the annual accounts, uh, to amend articles of incorporation, and to dissolve the company. Very important decisions. The shareholder does, ha does have the right to exert influence on the policy of the company. And in general, the shareholder should leave it up to the supervisory board to make sure that the director acts in conformity with the policy of the company. Direct interference by the shareholder with the day-to-day -day operation is, however, in general, considered highly undesirable. Now, what is clear from the uh, aforementioned is that the execution of the day-to-day -day operation in the company is a task that has been explicitly reserved for, as I said, the director. And the supervisory board of directors and the shareholders should therefore not be involved in the execution of this day-to-day -day policy. <clears throat> that being said, I now come to discussing to discuss the different grounds uh, for directors' personal liability. So here it becomes more interesting, I hope. Um, the director's liability outside of bankruptcy situations. Um, at first, undertaking and or operating a business also means taking certain risks. And it is uh, specifically because of that reason that uh, the director in a company is attributed a significant amount of power. The fact, however, that uh, a certain decision is in, in hindsight appears to be unfortunate or damaging the company does not, not automatically lead to uh, liability of its director. But when a director goes beyond the borders of what is considered to be reasonable, he, she, or again it, might be held liable for damages. Now, Article 14 of the Second Book of the Civil Code of St. Martin 
determines that the director is obligated to fulfill his or her tasks on behalf of the company in a proper manner. There's nothing new to the horizon. The law itself does not provide a further clarification of this criterion. But there is the Dutch Supreme Court in The Hague springing into the um, lagoon, uh, because the, Supreme, the Dutch Supreme Court held that uh, a managing director is liable for improper management if, of course, depending of, on all the circumstances, he can be attributed a serious reproach, or in Dutch, an ernstig verwijt. Um, the Dutch Supreme Court has outlined that this would be the case when a reasonable acting and experienced managing director would have opted not to perform his or, his or her duties in such a manner under the same circumstances, which is a very broad criterion, of course. As in Dutch it translates as that geen redelijk denkend bestuurder onder dezelfde omstandigheden aldus zou hebben gehandeld. A rather fake criterion, don't you think? Um, in case it has been determined that improper management exists or has existed, the managing director may be held personally liable for referential damages incurred as a direct consequence of his modus operandi, his acts or omissions. And a few examples I will mention are, in the first place, committing fraudulent or other criminal acts, two, withdrawing funds from the company for personal means or use, um, taking irresponsible and unacceptable fi financial risks, and last one, not having insurances in place that are required for the business at hand. Now it is only the company itself who is, that is entitled to hold the managing director liable on the basis of um, Article 14 of the Second Book of the Civil Code of St. Martin. Third parties that were disadvantaged by uh, the actions or non-actions of the director shall have to try to get their damages compensated through a claim based on tort, unlawful acts or in Dutch onrechtmatige daad, which is um, laid down in Article 162, Book 6, for if you want to specifically know, of the Dutch of the St. Martin Civil Code. And it has now become consequent case law from the Dutch Supreme Court that a director who gives the false appearance that the company is solvent, knowing that the company is in fact not in its position to fulfill all its financial obligations, acts unlawfully. The director in that case will personally have to compensate the, the disadvantaged creditors for all damages incurred. Um, I now come to some practical uh, issues. I will now discuss uh, three um, judgments. The first of one, uh, the first judgment is given by the appeals court in Arnhem in the Netherlands and dates from January 11, 2001. What was the case? Um, there was a food for oil program uh, set up by the United Nations um, and during that time a large quantity of potatoes had been delivered by a Dutch company to a government-owned company, company in Iraq that was still, then still governed by Saddam Hussein. Part of the deal was an unlawful so-called kickback payment to the Iraqi company, which was conveniently called um, after sales service. Very, very clever. Um, and at the time, it was not allowed to make financial means available to the then existing Republic of Iraq because of UN sanctions imposed on, upon the country. However, the Dutch company involved was eventually able to avoid prosecution by paying certain amounts, among which an amount equaling twice the amount of the kickback. Money makes the world go round, doesn't it? Um, the company then pointed its arrows towards uh, its own director, who was in charge at the time, and claimed compensation of the amounts paid uh, to the prosecution, prosecution service. Um, now, the appeals court in Arnhem rules that the director can be made a serious reproach with, rega with regard to the shortcomings in the proper fulfillment of his duties as managing director in this case, because he should have known better than to commit this offence. The court of appeals, however, lenient as always, mitigated the liability of the director to a certain extent due to the fact 
that he was given much freedom in the way the company was managed and the supervisory board of directors and the general assembly of shareholders had not done anything to supervise or stop the director's actions at the time, although they should have known better, all according to the court in Arnhem. Then I come to um, a judgment um, from the Dutch Supreme Court in The Hague, uh, dated July the 10th of 2009. Um, and I hope I have not bored you or tired you in, uh, enough by now, because the facts are quite elaborate, so please pay attention <coughs> very well. What was the case? The facts were that in 1999, Company X, company that was active in the travel business, started to work together with Company Y, a company dealing in the lease of apartments, bungalows, and hotel reservations. And part of the deal was that Company Y would collect the payments of customers in foreign, in foreign countries and subsequently forward the payments to Company X after deduction of its own fees. But what was the case? Company Y stopped paying Company X altogether during the course of 2000 and was subsequently declared bankrupt in October 2001. Company X then filed a claim against the director of Company Y, claiming that uh, he misused funds that were allocated to pay the debts uh, of Company X by using them to buy a parcel of land in his own personal name and build a house on that property. Also, by accepting certain insurance coverages from customers without actually paying them through, forwarding, forwarding them to the insurance company. And due to the fact, uh, however, that from the financials of the company, uh, it appeared that Company Y itself out owed a significant amount of money to the director personally at the time, both the appeals court and the Dutch Supreme Court decided that the payments used for the personal piece of land and the house of the director of Company Y could not, could not be seen as the reason for not being able to pay the outstanding debts to Company X. Um, with regard to the insurances, uh, co insurance coverage, uh, sorry, with regard to the insurance insurances for which the premiums, premiums were collected by Company Y, but no insurance coverage was arranged by the director in question, the appeals, appeals court held that this could not lead to a successful claim for damages from the side of Company X because Company X had been unable to prove that Company Y had been under the obligation to contract these insurances through Company X and could therefore not prove that Company X had in fact suffered any, damage, any concrete damages.